Fighting COVID-19, what a registered dietitian knows that others don't. My name is Jennifer Brockstroman, and I am a registered dietitian and sports nutritionist from London, Ontario, Canada. I'm the owner of a nutrition consulting company called Nutrition RX, and I've worked as a foods and nutrition professor at Western University these past eight years. In light of coronavirus and how rapidly it's spreading across the world, I felt compelled to share what I know about healthy eating and foods and nutrition and what you can do to keep yourself safe at home. So let's begin. As everyone's probably seen this graph on flattening the curve, the goal of mainstream social distancing and isolation right now is to give our healthcare system support by slowing the spread of coronavirus or COVID-19 through the population. Since we can only control what we do within our own actions, I thought I'd spend today's presentation on some healthy eating strategies and other interventions you can apply at home to keep yourself and your family as healthy as possible. So if we look at the contagiousness of coronavirus, one of the things that you'll notice is at the early evidence, it looks like it has a basic reproduction number or basically how contagious this virus is of 2.5. What that means is for every one individual infected, they are most likely going to transmit it on to two and a half people on average. However, this might change as we learn more about coronavirus in the months to come and have more international statistics to draw from. One thing that was very interesting as I began my research for this coronavirus presentation was looking at how long coronavirus can linger on various surfaces. So this is a really recent publication from January 2020 from the Journal of Hospital Infection. And they took coronavirus and sprayed it onto a variety of inanimate surfaces and looked at basically how long they could still find activated coronavirus that was still contagious. It appears that in air, coronavirus remains contagious up to about three hours. On surfaces like paper, so things like cardboard paper, three to 24 hours. Surfaces like glass, two to six days, wood, up to four days, and metal and plastic actually had the longest staying power between about five to nine days. The other thing that this Journal of Hospital Infection research paper looked at was on average, how many times do people make contact with their face, which is one of the main modes of transmitting the disease from your hands or from a surface to your eyes, your nose, your mouth to get it inside your system. And on average, people touch their face about 23 times an hour, which is why you're seeing some of the countries that have been able to flatten their curve a little bit better than others. They have widespread mask use where members of mainstream society are wearing masks, not fully to stop just the transmission of disease, but also to stop people from touching their face and transmitting the disease back to themselves. So keep these numbers in mind, and we're gonna come back to this uh, concept of how long it remains infectious for on various surfaces when we talk about cleaning practices a little bit later in the presentation. Now, our white blood cells are one of our main ways that our body will try to take care of this infection on our own. And they're highly responsive to things that we have direct control over to try to strengthen our immune system. So today's presentation will cover things that you can use from a nutrition standpoint, a rest recovery standpoint, a stress management standpoint, and also using tactics like social distancing and maintain a wide enough spread between human to human contact to again, do your part to help flatten the curve and keep your own system healthy. Now, my very first tip of today's presentation is to consider the concept of spheres of control. We have a green bubble representing total control, a ye yellow bubble representing some control, and a red bubble representing no control. With how much we're reading in the news and on social media, it's really easy to get our heads wrapped up in the red bubble of no control. We can't control the wet markets where this came out of. We can't necessarily control what our government or our politicians are saying or what laws that they're mandating we might have some control over influencing others around us to practice great social distancing and clean hand hygiene protocols. But what I would like to bring today's presentation all about is how to bring our focus, how to bring our mindset, how to bring our actions inside the bubble of total control, because this is the place you're going to be most empowered. This is the place you're going to have the largest impact. And this is one of the ways you're going to keep yourself as healthy as possible 
to hopefully not get so sick that you require the help of ICU and ventilation support. So let's move forward within the green bubble of total control. One of the first things I can't emphasize enough as a registered dietitian and nutrition coach is right now using the value of healthy eating as a form of medicine. While our researchers, scientists, and doctors work on treating the sick, developing a vaccine, and coming up with medications that work to help those that are already infected, one of the most proactive ways that you can keep yourself healthy is to actually really consider what you're putting into your body right now. Whole food eating, healthy food eating, is a really powerful form of medicine. Later on in my talk today, I'm going to go into some of the micronutrients specifically that interact with our white blood cells and our immune system. But one of the things that you can do if you are stuck at home at the moment is to do a fridge, freezer, and pantry assessment. Now, when I counsel nutrition clients, I try to come from the mindset of being curious, being kind, and being honest. There, there's no time and no need for an inner bully or critic to show up. So if we can do this evaluation of our home with curiosity, kindness, and honesty, we're going to make better strides to eat better than if we get hypercritical of ourselves or our family members. So if you were to open your refrigerator door, if you were to peer inside of your freezer or your pantry, would you find healthy, nutritious foods that support your immune system? Or would you find a number of packaged and convenience options that maybe don't necessarily give your body all the vitamins, minerals, and healthy nutrients it needs to stay in a beneficial state. So I'm gonna make this more practical in the slides to come, but my very first tip within the green sphere of control is to do a home assessment of what you have available to eat, and is this something that's genuinely supportive of your immune system? Now on that line or on that note, I wanna to speak to the value of having a food plan and batch cooking but I also want to emphasize the need to not panic and start hoarding food from the grocery stores. More than ever, we have to work collectively as humans to not go beyond our means and to share food and to share essential supplies and resources, especially with those that might be most vulnerable. One of my advice to my nutrition clients is to think about maybe three to four healthy meals that you can batch prepare in a larger quantity and put portions away in the fridge and freezer. And this serves a number of wonderful, wonderful benefits. One, this hopefully helps you eat more nutrient-rich whole foods. Two, if you do happen to get sick and you do some batch cooking ahead of time when you're feeling quite well, this will give you access to healthy foods when maybe you feel feverish, lightheaded, dizzy or nauseous, but you still wanna maintain your strength. You'll have options put away in the freezer and fridge to eat when you don't feel so great. Three, if you have little ones or dependents and again you get sick, this is a great way for other family members to pitch in and help out and feed those when you're not maybe feeling wonderful yourself. And finally, this can also support with food waste and hoping to reduce what gets thrown in our landfills so healthy food does not go to waste. So think about some meals that your family enjoys. Again, there's many right ways to eat healthy, so I'm not going to preach one eating style over another but maybe that means roasting up some trays of vegetables. Maybe that means making a pot of, you know, bean filled vegetarian or uh, low, you know, um, healthy protein chili. Maybe it's making a sweet potato shepherd's pie or a chicken and brown rice and veggie filled curry. You know, thinking about options that your family maybe enjoys to eat and going out and buying just the ingredients you need to make those recipes in a larger quantity and then doing some cooking right now. Another strategy while you're at home trying to take care of your immune system is to make your intake of fruits and veggies as high as you possibly can and to make it as colorful as you possibly can. And one takeaway resource I wanted to make available to the public right away as a free download is this vegetable and fruit rainbow variety color challenge. So on this particular resource, I've made a document that has more than 100 different colored fruits and veggies. Now, by all means, this doesn't capture all the fruits and veggies in the world, so please feel free to customize this to what's available in your local community. But what you can do is hang this on the refrigerator door or keep it somewhere near the grocery list, and every week, make a point to get a food from the red, the orange, the yellow, the dark green, the blue purple, and the white family of fruits and veggies, and try to stray away from your normal routine, favorite five, 10, or 15 items. Most of my clients, if I were to look at their grocery list, 
they would buy the same things over and over. So every week they might get carrots and salad greens and bananas and apples and you know cucumber. Um, again, it depends where, where you live and what's local to your region. However, I'd like to challenge you if it is available and it is cost effective to continue to push your boundaries and maybe try some new recipes that incorporate some new fruits and veggies or go back to favorites that you've just forgotten about and it's been a long time since you've tried. If you have little ones at home, this is a great way to expose them to other healthy foods and even have them maybe help out and pick a new color each week um, and a food that they might be interested in trying. So if this resource interests you, I've made it available for free for download on my website. If you go to www.nutritionrx.ca slash coronavirus dash immunity. So feel free to grab that and play along while you're um, quarantined through coronavirus and trying your best to stay healthy. Another thing that you can do while you're at home is to make the healthy choice the easiest choice possible for yourself and your family members. So one of the things I love to encourage my nutrition clients to do is to make something every week called a veggie bucket. I know for myself, I often used to just put my fruits and veggies in the crisper drawer, and although I had great meaning intentions to eat everything that I purchased, I used to nickname and call my crisper drawer the drawer of death. It's unfortunately where some of my vegetables went to die. So one of the things I've started to implement that's really increased the amount of whole food fruits and veggies that I now eat is every week when I go to the grocery store, instead of putting my fruits and veggies right into the crisper, I try to wash and prep my vegetables and then transfer them into a container with a lid so that way they're easily accessible week after week after week. So then if I want to do a salad, I'm three quarters of the way there with my washed greens and I can add in some extra veggies. If I want to make a stir fry, again, it's very easy to just dice a little bit further and make a big stir fry. And so by continuing this habit and attaching it to part of grocery shopping, A, there's less food wastage, and B, you're just making the healthy choice the easiest choice possible, and you're more likely to reach for healthy options versus less healthy options when you do need a snack or a meal, and again, to get that veggie quantity up. So consider making the healthy choice the easy choice through this process of staying home with coronavirus quarantine and helping your family members um, eat more vegetables as well. Another thing to think about is our snack planning. So again, there is as little waste as possible and as healthfully as we can possibly snack. Now, not everyone's going to need a snack. So again, individual needs may vary. But if you do find you feel best with a healthy snack between your meals, one of the ideas I often coach for my regular busy workforce is the idea of pick two, make 10. And how pick two, make 10 works is you would decide on two healthy snacks for the week, you buy your snacks in bulk, and then you can get them all ready at one time so they're ready to go in the fridge, front and center, washed, prepped, ready to eat. So one week I might pick apples and almonds, and then the afternoon snack might be veggies and hummus, and on one day of my week that I'm doing my food prep, it's just as easy to wash five or 10 apples at once as it is to do one at a time. Then, so I don't get bored of the same eating routine, the next week I might pick two entirely different snacks, maybe blueberries and yogurt and pears and hard boiled eggs. And again, if I'm gonna boil one hard boiled egg, it's just as easy to make five or 10 or 15 for my whole family as it is to just boil them one at a time. Then maybe the following week, I might pick a fruit like grapes and pair that with a small amount of cheese and maybe do cashews and uh, kiwis. So again, don't worry that it has to be these snacks per se, but right now to buy things in bulk, on sale, hopefully in season, allows you to sort of make your grocery money stretch a little bit further. Finances are going to be a little bit tighter for a number of individuals given the um, economic consequences of social distancing and business shutdowns. So this is hopefully both a strategy that's economically friendly and time friendly, where you can eat well week after week, um, but minimize the effort and maximize the health benefit. I also wanted to spend some time in the presentation today talking about which nutrients play a really vital role in the health of our immune system and specifically things you can do to strengthen your white blood cells ability to fight off this virus if you do happen to get sick. So the first nutrient I'd like to focus in on is the importance of protein. Without turning this into a giant science lecture, 
One of the things you have to understand about protein is it's a physical building block for our white blood cells to build something called an antibody. So those little blue sticks on the screen that look like the letter Y, those are antibodies. Think of them like ninja throwing stars that our white blood cells whip out and will throw at a pathogen. So a virus, bacteria, um, something that shouldn't be inside of our cell. These antibodies, these ninja stars will stick onto the surface of the pathogen and they will alert other white blood cells to come along and look for the receptor sites on the antibodies. And then that helps the white blood cells identify which viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens need to be destroyed. There is quite concrete evidence in, um, in nutrition that individuals who are protein deficient are much more likely to die from infectious disease than individuals that have appropriate levels of protein intake. So there's a wide array of protein sources that we can get whole food protein from, both from plants and animal sources. I won't go into those details here because it's pretty easy, easy to Google you know, healthy sources of protein. But it is important that you're making sure that you're having protein multiple times throughout your day. So you have the building blocks to, to, to continue to build these antibodies that your white blood cells use as part of their attack against a foreign agent. The next nutrient I'd like to talk about for protecting our immune systems is the importance of vitamin C. And I have some good news and I have some bad news. Before you run out and raid your vitamin C supplement shelf at your local pharmacy or grocery store, this is one place that I'm really going to emphasize as a registered dietitian that whole foods is the best way to go in this category. Now we do sometimes see benefit from taking vitamin C supplements, but that would only be in individuals that have a nearly fruit and vegetable deficient diet. If you're already eating a wide variety of vitamin C rich foods, the vitamin C supplements don't tend to offer much additional benefit beyond what we see from placebo benefits. So another way to say that is because the placebo effect often can give a 20 to 30% benefit because the brain believes taking something makes our body respond and behave in a slightly different way. For the most part, I would encourage you to save your money on vitamin C supplements. And instead, I would encourage you to invest your food money in vitamin C rich foods. So where are the best sources to get vitamin C from? Well, that would be our citrus fruits. So lemons, limes, oranges, kiwis, grapefruits, other fruits like strawberries are excellent sources of vitamin C. And a lot of the dark green vegetables can also be amazing sources. So broccoli and kale and Brussels sprouts. And bell peppers are another overlooked um, food that are a fantastic source of vitamin C. Now you don't have to eat crazy high amounts of vitamin C rich foods to meet your daily needs. Um, for most people, it would be one or two items from that list every single day would more than be sufficient. And just keep in mind that if you're a smoker, your vitamin C needs are slightly higher than non-smokers. So it's especially important for smokers to have vitamin C rich foods every single day. The next nutrient that's really important during this coronavirus outbreak because of how coronavirus interacts with our lungs is the significance of having appropriate levels of vitamin D. One really fascinating research study that was a meta-analysis and it looked at 25 really well-designed randomized control trials that included more than 11,000 participants between the ages of zero to 95 showed a statistically significant benefit of taking vitamin D supplementation. And especially in those that were vitamin D deficient, vitamin D supplementation played a major important role in preventing acute respiratory tract infections. So given the seriousness of coronavirus's interaction with our lungs, this is a nutrient of concern that I really wanted to address in the presentation today. Now, this is a place where I'm going to break my whole food guideline, and I'm actually going to talk about a supplement's first approach. First, as a dietitian, I still would like to give you the whole food options to improve your vitamin D status. But you'll see that unless you live near the equator and you get strong sunshine on your skin year round, anyone that's in a very northern or southern latitude is going to struggle with vitamin D sufficiency in their blood work. So here are the whole food ways first to get your vitamin D needs met. Salmon, tuna, and other um, pink oily marine fish can be great sources of vitamin D, but you'd have to have a filet of salmon or tuna nearly every single day to maintain your vitamin D status. 
that gets a little bit tricky to do after a long period of time. Some countries like Canada, where I'm from, fortify their milk with vitamin D, but in order to meet our daily amount, so for a, a children to adults one to age 70, the recommended amount of vitamin D is 600 international units. And for adults 71 and older, it goes up to 800 international units. So I'll say that again, from ages one to 71, we require 600 international units of vitamin D and ages 71 and older, 800 international units of vitamin D. So you can get that from a filet of salmon or tuna. To get that from milk, you would actually have to drink 1.5 liters of milk or six glasses of milk every single day in order to get 600 international units. So you can see that that's a pretty unrealistic amount of milk to drink and not necessarily everyone even does drink milk. A third whole food source that you can get vitamin D from is from egg yolks. But to meet your vitamin D quota of 600 international units, you'd have to consume about 30 egg yolks a day in order to consume enough vitamin D to get there from whole foods. So that's not really realistic. And one of the only vegetables in the world that contains some vitamin D is actually the vegetable mushrooms. However, you'd have to consume about five cups of mushrooms per day on average in order to maintain a 600 international unit standard of intake. So you can see that between fish and milk and eggs and mushrooms, there are very few foods out there that actually do naturally supply us with vitamin D. Most of the time, humans are designed to get vitamin D from their skin in direct sunlight. Um, but for many of us, especially those that are stuck inside, this is going to be especially difficult. So you can buy it in the pill form or you can buy it in the drop form. Most of the stores now sell it at 1,000 international units, which more than meets your daily quota of 600. The safe upper limit from supplements is 4,000 international units. There are some medical conditions that require more than 4,000 international units a day, but you should always talk to your family doctor first before you exceed that upper limit. So some is good, but more is not better. This is a fat-soluble supplement, a fat-soluble vitamin, and there can be toxicity at really high doses. So stay within you know, 600 to 4,000 international units a day. And another thing to note about vitamin D, because it is fat-soluble, is it's only absorbed in the presence of fat. So if you currently are taking a vitamin D supplement in the pill form, please make sure that you consume your pill with some food fat at the same time. Don't take it on an empty stomach or with a glass of water because it needs that fat to get pulled across the intestinal lining and get into the bloodstream. Now the vitamin D liquid drops, they have solved that problem because they're almost always paired with an MCT oil carrier or a medium chain triglyceride carrier. So with the liquid drops, they've already added the fat to the vitamin D formulation. So the drops you can put in a glass of water, drop it on your tongue, drop it on top of your dinner greens. Um, however you're going to eat it or consume it, it basically gets absorbed in the drop format. So again, given the seriousness of how coronavirus affects our lungs, if you're not currently supplementing with vitamin D, and you're not easily meeting your needs from those whole food options or you're getting lots of sunlight on your skin that would be strong enough to develop a bit of a tan, then you're probably vitamin D deficient. And this would be something I would encourage you to consider um, once you've evaluated your own situation. Now, moving on to zinc, zinc plays a really critical role in our immune system by specifically supporting our T helper cells which help to mount an invasion against foreign invaders like coronavirus and kill it off. So zinc is found naturally in a lot of um, seafood, especially things like clams, oysters, mussels, a lot of the shellfish. We can also get zinc from whole food sources like whole grains, legumes, beans, lentils. There's a little bit in some fruits and veggies depending on the soil content. But again, if we look at some peer-reviewed evidence on the value of zinc to human health, um, zinc plays a very important role in the immune system. Some early evidence with coronavirus specifically seems to show that zinc helps to kill off this particular virus. So there's a couple things you can do. Whole food eating will always be of benefit to you. So there, you'll never go wrong having some of those whole food sources of zinc. Additionally, if you're able to find them, there have been some early indication that the zinc lozenges that you can suck on in your throat 
coronavirus hangs out in the larynx and the upper respiratory tract first before it migrates down deeper into the lungs, causing those pneumonia-like side effects. So they've been able to find that individuals who are able to kind of uh, suck on a zinc lozenges and sort of have that zinc coat their throat seems to help support killing off the virus or at least minimizing the virus's spread and replication before it has a chance to get down into the lungs. Now, I know it's overwhelming and scary to think about how to get all these nutrients into the body. So again, I wanted to make this as user-friendly as possible for the public. And what I've prepared for you for free as an available download is a whole food nutrition guide. So I have a two-page document with all the key minerals, all the key vitamins. I've put the different ages, gender, and upper limit targets. So you don't have to research how much zinc do I need? How much vitamin D do I need? How much vitamin C do I need? I've done all that work for you. And then what I've also done is giving you a function list explaining how that vitamin or mineral acts in your body to keep your immune system healthy. And then also the most important list, what are the top highest whole food sources to get those nutrients into your body? So a really interesting activity you might wanna to consider to do right now would be to download and print this whole food nutrition guide. And again, when you're doing your kitchen assessment, check off which foods you have in your fridge, in your freezer, and in your pantry. And then what this uh, particular document will allow you to do is you'll very quickly see your blind spots. So you might have you know, an excellent intake of vitamin C right now, but when you get into the zinc category, you might realize that there's not necessarily a lot of foods that you're eating or you have access to in your home kitchen from the zinc category. So this gives you a shopping list of foods that you can start to add in to protect your body from a whole food approach. So I hope you find that work helpful that I've put together for you. And again, that's available for free for download at nutritionrx.ca slash coronavirus dash immunity. Now, the next very important tip related to coronavirus specifically that you have control over at home is to stay really well hydrated. We know that the coronavirus behaves a lot like a really severe flu, where there's a high likelihood of having fever, sweating, and in some cases, vomiting or even diarrhea. Those are all ways that we can deplete our fluid status. So it's important that in order to not necessarily need hospitalized support, if we're able to maintain excellent hydration status at home, that will hopefully keep us out of the hospitals and uh, not needing medical intervention with IV therapy if we do become extremely dehydrated. Although, never hold back from getting support if you're in a situation where you're vomiting or have such severe diarrhea that you are becoming quite dangerously dehydrated. Please do seek medical attention if it gets to that state. Another tip I just wanted to mention is that for those of us who aren't sick with coronavirus, most of us have had a major disruption in our regular routines. I know for me, it took me a couple days to realize that my normal water bottle that I keep at work at my desk was trapped at work with social distancing and isolation, and I hadn't replicated that same sort of setup in my home office. So it took me a couple days to kind of get back on top of my hydration um, routines and habits that were so nailed down and excellent at work. Now, a very interesting piece of research um, or piece of feedback that started to come out from Chinese health officials when they've done autopsies on unfortunately some of the individuals that have already passed away from coronavirus is when they looked inside their lungs, obviously we know the lungs are hardest hit from this disease, really thick mucus was filling the lung, um, the lung pockets and was contributing to death. And so they were finding that the individuals who maintain a better hydration status especially individuals that were drinking more hot fluids, better broke up the mucus and they didn't have as severe lung complications than those that were less well hydrated. So as a dietitian tip, one of the things I thought could be a really wonderful combination is to do the daily habit of having a hot cup of water with maybe some lemon juice poured into it. And there's two benefits of this. Lemon juice is an exceptionally high source of vitamin C so that's going to give you some vitamin C boost every single day. And then the hot water, again, is wonderful for breaking down that mucus in the lungs. So if you're not a regular tea drinker or you're not you know, having lots of hot liquids, this might be a new habit to adopt um, to A, keep your lungs sort of breaking up that mucus and clear, 
And then B, it's another great way to maintain your vitamin C status as well. We've all heard the importance of maintaining really impeccable cleaning guidelines. So I won't uh, overstress this point because it's coming at us from all different angles. Remember that when hot washing our hands, we wanna use soap and hot water and last long enough, so about 20 seconds or longer, that you could get through the happy birthday song twice. And the other thing to consider, as our hospitals are doing everything they can to disinfect and keep those environments clean for sick individuals, is doing what we can at home to clean our own food preparation environments and high touch surfaces in the house, especially with multiple family members. So not only do we wanna wipe down our countertops before and after food preparation, but consider some of the high touch surfaces that maybe don't necessarily get cleaned often or at all. So think about cupboard and drawer handles being touched by multiple family members, giving them a wipe down with a disinfecting agent. Think about the refrigerator handle, that's a high touch point. Think about cleaning off your cell phone, your computer, your keyboards, places that you're touching multiple times a day. It's also really important to be washing and cleaning and changing over our dish rags, our tea towels, our hand towels, um, and also things like the front door where people might have touched it and have come and gone from a similar access point. If you recall the, the contagiousness of coronavirus, one of my first slides, think about plastic and metal and glass having often between a three to nine day kind of incubation period where that virus can remain, remain viable and contagious. So we're making a point in our house to watch everything on high heat. We're putting all of our rags through um, at least once a day and changing over our rags a few times. We're making sure everything is impeccably clean before and after food preparation. I'm giving wipe downs on extra surfaces like drawer and covered handles and the fridge and the front door. And I'm cleaning my cell phone and my computer much more frequently just to make sure those high touch points are not having any of the virus lingering on it um, if say we've gone out grocery shopping and we've come back home. This might be a little bit overprepared, but the other thing we're doing with food that comes home from the grocery store is we have an active pantry in our kitchen and we have a quarantine pantry downstairs. So foods that have just recently come home from the grocery store with surfaces like paper, so cardboard boxes and things like that, they go to our downstairs pantry and we wait at least three to five days after we've wiped them down and left them in the basement alone. We eat out of our active kitchen pantry and then we rotate the foods from the basement once they've had those three to five days for hopefully anything that someone has touched that might have put the virus onto it. We wait at least three to five days before they can make its way upstairs to our current pantry. That might be a little bit of an overkill reaction, but I would rather you know, be safe rather than sorry. So again, go back to that slide a bit earlier for the, the uh, contagiousness points and think about have I wiped down surfaces like plastic and metal and glass frequently because again, the virus can remain almost up to a week on those surfaces. Now, another thing we can do to hopefully keep our, our biological system operating at its peak capacity is to think about getting our body to sink back into our parasympathetic state. So without making this too much of a science lecture, I just wanted to briefly explain the difference between our parasympathetic recovery system and our sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic, think of the letter S for siren or the letter S for stress. This is our flight or fight nervous system. This is the system that will produce a lot of cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and it's when we're really anxious, jacked up, nervous, high edge, on, you know, highly stressed, on edge, this is the nervous system that actually tends to suppress the most optimal functioning of our white blood cells. Many of us this last week or so have most definitely been on high alert, and it's been a very stressful time for most of our communities. So what we want to do is we want to reassure our body that we can come back to a place of calm and peace and rest, and this activates a secondary nervous system called our parasympathetic nervous system. I always think of the letter P for peace. So I put a little meditating frog on the screen to help be a visual for the parasympathetic nervous system. This nervous system operates best when we are resting, digesting, and in forms of recovery. So when we sleep, when we're relaxed, when we do gentle exercise, like going for walks or hikes or yoga, 
deep breathing is one of the best ways to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you have been shallow breathing and have been very anxious, making a point to slow down and take three to five long, slow, deep recovery breaths or researching something called box breathing where you breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four, hold for four. And you can go through a few cycles of that tactical breathing or that box breathing. Practicing meditation. You, there's apps on YouTube, there's things like Headspace or Calm, um, or even just trying to set a timer for 60 seconds to maybe five minutes to just quiet your mind and let the past, let the thoughts kind of pass through without really assigning any judgment or introspection on them. We can use our pets, making sure that we're remaining, you know, lighthearted and we can laugh and listen to upbeat music. Um, stress management tactics that work for you. Maybe that's decluttering and cleaning the house helps deal with some of that anxiety, or it's coloring or having art or music or a, a hobby or play or board games or puzzles. Although there's a lot that's scary and beyond our control, if we can kind of focus inwards on ways that we can make our body feel safe, like it has the ability to rest, recover, and care for ourselves, believe it or not, biologically, that really helps to switch on and allow your white blood cells to do the best job possible. And that does help to protect your immune system from COVID-19. One thing that I've been really enjoying and that has been so valuable to my mental and physical health has been maintaining my fitness routine. So I'm normally a get up in the morning and go to the gym kind of girl, but obviously with our gym being closed, with everything shut down in Canada, um, I tried my best to make a little home gym out of the objects I had available. So I did have some weights at home, thankfully, but I've turned one of my nutrition textbooks into a weight. I have an extra bag of jog food on standby for my pet, and that right now is a weight I can carry up and down the stairs or do goblet squats with. We have some extra water, drinking water on standby just in case we need it, but it makes a great weight for farmer's carries, you know, a skipping rope. I've been doing a lot of body weight jumping jacks and lunges and burpees and squats and push-ups and sit-ups. And I'm very fortunate that my local gym has decided to switch our classes into online group training classes through Zoom. But even just in the craziness of what's been going on, maintaining that routine, maintaining that more normality, having a healthy outlet for stress. So even if it just means that you take the stairs a few more times in your house, or you do some push-ups or air squats, or you do some gentle yoga because that makes your body feel better, try to maintain some physical movement. And that also, although in the moment can kind of get your system a little bit more revved up, the recovery after exercise is a great way to also activate that parasympathetic recovery. So really important to stay active if you're able to through the stress of being on lockdown. Now, as I was going deep down into my coronavirus research, I looked at some of the other pandemics that have hit humans throughout the centuries. And our last most recent major pandemic was the Spanish flu or the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. And what was fascinating is I found some early evidence that showed there was a certain group of individuals that recovered better than, than expected. And it was actually soldiers that ended up getting the Spanish flu. The hospitals were overfilled and they had ran out of beds, very similar to situations that we're starting to see around the world. And what they did with the soldiers is they put them in outdoor tents and on the sunny days, they would bring their cots outside. And what they actually found is that fresh air and sunlight were protective to not only the medical patients, but the medical staff that were treating the patients. The patients re responded better than those in hospital in terms of their overall survival statistics, and the medical staff got less sick caring for these patients. What we've now been able to verify is that fresh air actually can help reduce the viral load and kill things like the flu virus and other harmful germs. And we know that sunlight is a germicidal agent. So if you do happen to get sick, if you're able to bundle up and maybe go sit on a balcony or your backyard and take in some fresh sunlight, maybe with a blanket and a mug of tea, um, if you're not sick and you're able to still get outside, now obviously respect your local community's quarantine rules. This might not be possible for everyone. I know our plan is that when the weather gets nice enough and we can open our windows and let some fresh air blow through the house, um, we have a little back balcony. So if we can go sit outside and just get some fresh air on our skin, 
again, maybe there's a vitamin D link with the fresh air, the sunlight, and vitamin D production. It's all interconnected. So just think about using fresh air and sunlight as another little medicinal tool in your back pocket to help you through what might be to come in the weeks and months ahead of us. Lastly, as we start to wrap up, I want to go back to mindset because our mind is so powerful how it can influence our biological response in the body. One thing that I think has been really important through all of the stress and craziness is to really be grateful because when you're grateful, it's difficult to be anxious at the same time. I know for me, whenever I sit down to have a meal, I'm really trying to think and put energy into being so grateful for all the people that brought that food to my table, the farmers that grew my food, the delivery truck drivers that moved the food around, the grocery store clerks that stocked the shelves, the grocery store, uh, store checkout agents that have allowed you know, us to come home with healthy food. I think about all the individuals that are you know, struggling to put food on the table or don't have enough to eat. And also the fact that I mean, not necessarily everywhere in the world, but most of us who are listening to this presentation, this isn't World War II. We're not running out and dodging bullets and bombs in order to safely go get food and bring it back to our house. So I feel like there's so much to be grateful for, and it makes me feel um, extra protective of making sure that I don't have food waste right now, that I'm not hoard buying, that I'm only buying what I need, that I can leave enough food and supplies for everyone in my community, especially those that are vulnerable. And so it's this kind of community spirit of coming together and not being selfish and only taking what you need and being thankful for how interconnected we are of how our food supply and food system works. Another sort of interesting gift that's come out of this lockdown and being stuck at home for many of us that you know aren't rushing off to go to the hospital and, and go to our regular jobs, is this is a really beautiful opportunity to practice more mindful-based eating. So trying to eat more slowly, more mindfully, to really taste our food, to chew our food more slowly, to not be watching television or be on our phones with social media, and just really take advantage of not rushing out of the house and to be present and enjoy our meals. So much of us live in a really hectic, busy, go, go, go society. So again, I'm trying to look for the upside of being on quarantine and, be, you know, everyone on doing social isolation, social distancing, and mindful eating is a great way just to practice a new skill and get everything um, positive that we can from our meal and the enjoyment from that meal. And lastly, that dash of stoicism Again, it could be worse. This makes me grateful that you know there is enough food in our grocery stores at the present time. It makes me grateful that for most of us, we're not in an active state of war where there aren't roadside bombs we have to dodge to go out and get our food. So it does help to put it in perspective that although it's a really difficult time, it could be worse and there's still so many things to be grateful for. So I'm going to wrap up with our three circles of control. And as much as the news can be distressing, as much as watching the numbers climb globally with this pandemic can be really, really scary, it gets overwhelming if we stay in the some control or the no control bubble with our thoughts and with our actions. So we're gonna take those two bubbles away and we're gonna bring it back to our total control sphere. What can you fully control to keep yourself as healthy as possible and hopefully not require your local hospital services um, to, to beat this. Can we eat as healthy as possible using whole foods as medicine? Can we stay active in a way that you know, feels good to our body, but doesn't break down our body and distress it? Can we have healthy outlets for managing stress um, that are beyond just you know, drinking our, our woes away? Can we practice impeccably perfect hand hygiene and home cleanliness? Can we try to keep our mind less anxious and reshift our mindset to gratitude and stoicism and taking action on what we can actively control? Can we good, be good community members and maybe those that do have to be on quarantine, can we help them get their groceries? Does that mean not violating quarantine orders if we have been asked to stay home? And lastly, doing our part to flatten the curve and really respecting the power of social distancing so we can give our hospitals and healthcare workers a chance to treat those that do really need their help. So again, we'll wrap up with the idea or the mindset that success always starts with a goal. 
it's great to learn and read as much as you can about coronavirus up into a point where it becomes paralyzing and distressing. So what I hope you can take away from today are some really easy action-based tips to protect yourself and keep you and your family as healthy as you can. So hopefully you don't end up on the wrong side of the statistic. Can we use more whole foods as medicine? Can you maybe make a veggie bucket? Can you batch cook in case you do get sick? So you have some healthy whole food options available. Can you maintain you know, great fluid status by drinking lots of liquids and maybe starting to increase your intake of hot fluids if you do have more mucus buildup in your lungs? Can you have great cleaning guidelines around the house? If you've never really thought about it, your parasympathetic nervous system, can you make sure that you bring in some slow, deep recovery breathing, trying to have great sleep hygiene, trying to use exercise as a healthy stress outlet? Maybe you never realized that sunlight and fresh air are great germicidal agents, so you can use those at your disposal. Maybe your vitamin D status is really low when you think about that whole food list, and you've never considered taking vitamin D supplements before, and this could be protective for your lungs. So don't be overwhelmed with changing everything, but maybe there's a few things from that list that you're not actively doing at home that you can bring into your current lifestyle to take excellent care of your health. So I'll wrap up by saying that I will continue to share helpful evidence-based research if I can um, through my website and my various social media channels, and I'd love for you to follow along. Again, my name is Jennifer Brockstroman, and I am a registered dietitian and sports nutritionist in London, Ontario, Canada. Feel free if you have any questions to send me a message. I'm here to try to you know, spread what I can about healthy eating so you can take great care of yourself. And for anyone that is a Canadian citizen, and I know money's tight at this time, many Canadians do have health benefits through their employer to work with a registered dietitian. So if you do want a little one-on-one -on -one support for yourself or your family, we are here to help if you need it. So feel free to reach out. And what I most wanna make available to anyone in the world absolutely for free are some of those home resources to make healthy eating just a little more accessible and um, enjoyable. So if you'd like to play the veggie and fruit rainbow challenge with your family, it's a great way to get as many colorful fruits and veggies as you can. I've also shared the whole food nutrient list for all the important vitamins and minerals. So if you wanted to take a look at the vitamin C, the zinc and the vitamin D nutrients especially, they're gonna play a really important role. But if you do that home audit and you see which foods are maybe missing, you might have a better idea where your own personal nutrition gaps lie so you can better protect your immune system in the weeks and months to come. So thank you so much for listening to this presentation and I hope everyone can stay safe and healthy and as well prepared as they can within their own sphere of control. And again, I'm hoping all of you listening have a really great outcome with hopefully uh, we avoid the worst of what's to come. So thank you so much. And again, I'm around if you have any questions.